We're taking a tour of grand gardens across the world, and you get to take home a souvenir, ideas you can use in your garden. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home, where you'll find practical ideas, beautiful landscapes, and much more, all designed to help you push the boundaries of your home into the garden to the edges of your property. In today's show, we're going to plant with abundance. I'm going to fill this entire area of my garden with tulips. They'll be glorious next spring. But we're also going to visit some magnificent gardens in England. You see, I think it's a good way to learn good garden design by visiting some of the best gardens and learning from them. So we're going to take big ideas, extract them from these gardens, and apply them in our own gardens. If you're just getting started designing your garden, I think you'll find this show very helpful. I had an opportunity to study garden history and design in England, and as I walked through the gardens, I began to notice a theme repeating over and over. These gardens were divided in the same way a home is divided, by rooms, and the entire garden worked as an extension of the home. That's when I was struck with the inspiration to help teach Americans how to create their own garden homes, using ideas that I brought back from my studies in England. I know you're anxious to get started, so let's go. When I visit a place like this, I feel like I'm walking through the pages of a storybook. Beautiful landscape, castle on the hill, I halfway expect to see a knight riding over that hill in search of a fair maiden or a dragon. Well, this is Chumley Castle, and it's in the countryside in northwest England, a beautiful setting for a magnificent garden created by Lady Chumley herself. Now, while many of the gardens here in England are built on centuries of bits and pieces of other gardens. Here at Chumley Castle, Lord and Lady Chumley developed a piece of this pastoral landscape, a park-like setting, and created their own garden in the 1960s. Okay, hold everything. Before we get too far down the road at Chumley, I want to mention the 12 principles of design that I use when I create a garden home. You see, I look at these principles as a garden designer's checklist. When all 12 of them are present, great things can happen in the garden. They include ideas like accenting the entry, creating enclosure, and having fun in the garden. Now, there's no way we can cover all 12 of those principles in today's show, but we will touch on three important principles in the gardens we visit in England. And these are principles we often overlook when we create gardens at home. All right, let's start with this idea of focal point. You see, it can be any object that directs the viewer's eyes. For instance, in my fountain garden, the focal point is this large urn that I've planted with variegated agave. When you walk through this garden or view it from inside the house, your eyes are immediately drawn toward the agave. Now there's this principle of abundance that should be considered. Over and over again, you're going to see how plantings with gusto make a difference in the garden. I always think, why have one plant when you can have many? And don't think that achieving abundance requires a big pocketbook. Colorful annuals, seeds, and plants that are hardy volunteers can provide you with the look of an expensive landscape at a fraction of the cost. And as a third principle, we'll take a look at framing the view. So let's go back to England where I can explain this a little more. More than anything, I must have flowers. Always, always, or so said the French Impressionist painter Monet. And I have to agree. But you know, we can't be dazzled by the flowers alone. You see, to the artist, before he can begin considering these beautiful blooms and colors, you have to establish the composition. That's why I find a simple little viewfinder like this so helpful. It aids me in finding the most picturesque views. And the same can be said for designing your garden. Before we can begin planting beautiful flowers like these, we have to look at the bigger picture. Here at Chumley Castle, 
Deep in the countryside in Northwest England, Lady Chumley has laid out a magnificent garden where there's a beautiful picture at every turn. Now, while this garden is well known for its dramatic water feature, the Temple Garden, I've been inspired by many of the pictures Lady Chumley has painted throughout the garden with various combinations of plants. An example from my own garden of how I've framed the view is this look through the mirrored arbors of my fountain garden, across the lawn and over the rondelle to the tool shed. So you see, these big ideas do translate from large landscapes to our home gardens. A popular element in English gardens is the perennial herbaceous border. Now all this means is that you have plants that will die back after the first hard frost only to return again the next spring, all planted in a long border, hence the name perennial herbaceous border. Now Lady Chumley has taken a slightly different approach. What she has here is actually a mixed border, simply meaning that the plantings are mixed with trees, small woody shrubs such as roses, annuals, along with the perennials. Just look at some of these combinations. Even in the middle of August, there's a lot going on in this planting. You have barberry and purple cotinus planted in the back with aconitum or the monk's hood, creating sharp spires that come up through the border, along with a few bulbs like galtonia, called the summer hyacinth. Other tall spiky plants you can find in this border are verbascum and agapanthus, along with some very brightly colored penstemon. These are planted in combination with some annuals, such as cosmos. Now one of the nicest additions to this garden in the way of annuals for me are the different types of Nicotiana. Lady Chumley has planted Nicotiana sylvestris, which gets very tall and has these white pendulous blooms, as well as a Nicotiana called Lansdorfii, with tiny little chartreuse blooms. But I think the most important part of this border, and really any border, is the structure. And what we have here is a backdrop or a planting of plants that give us the framework that we need to really appreciate the flowers. You have the barberry, the smoke tree, these beautiful silver leaf pears, and in the borders, various roses. Two varieties I grow, one called Sally Holmes and the other Penelope. Other elements that lend interest to this garden are the pair of large evergreens that flank the entry into the rose garden, which is just beyond. And you can see a large sundial that serves as a focal point. A lot goes into making these borders beautiful in terms of the design, as well as the conditions here. Of course, plenty of rain certainly helps. But I think that the reason these borders always look so good is that there's something coming on all the time. None of these flowers all bloom at once. As you can see, there were geraniums several months ago. The roses were blooming just last month. But now you have lots of color coming on in the way of the penstemons, this beautiful agapanthus and phlox. And even later, we'll have asters that will come on. So it's important to remember that you should have a progression of bloom in the border right up until the first frost. There's so many wonderful plants to choose from, this is actually quite easy to achieve. In my front borders at home, when I first started laying them out, I took a mixed planting approach, as you can see here. But the shrubs were small. The roses I planted were just small two-gallon plants. So to fill in in the first year, I relied heavily on annuals. I used cosmos, nicotianas, just as we see here at Chumley Castle, as well as periwinkles and hyacinth bean vines to grow on the fences. By relying heavily on some of these annuals early on in the development of my garden, it gave me time to work out the other plantings. Each year I added a few more shrubs and a few more perennials. Now one of the ways that I made my selection was to always try to have good contrast between fine textured foliage, like you might see in this cosmos, contrasted to the strap-like leaves of the agapanthus creates more visual interest. The blooms themselves also are in contrast to one another. Contrasting the plant forms themselves can also create visual interest. Something tall and spiky next to a plant that's round and full can achieve that effect. You see, it really is just like making 
garden pictures as an artist would. And I find that coming to a beautiful garden like this here at Chumley Castle is a great place to gain inspiration and find new ideas. Now that we've learned a little about English borders, let me take you to one of the oldest borders in the entire United Kingdom. It's a breathtaking example located here at Arley Hall in the Cheshire countryside. When you look at this border, remember that design principle called abundance that I was talking about earlier. There's nothing like a profusion of blooms like these to dazzle us. The rich tapestry all these colors and textures make is really magnificent. Can you imagine all of these flowers in your garden? Well, this is quite some flower garden. In fact, it's one of the oldest herbaceous borders in Britain, dating back to the 1840s. Now, before we get into the history of the garden, let's just take a look at some of the beautiful flowers growing here. So what can we learn from such an inspiring place? Well, over the years, I've learned plenty from my visits to Arley. In fact, I've drawn a lot of inspiration from this place for my own front garden, both in terms of many of the plants I've used, as well as some of the basic design concepts. Let me show you what I mean. My front garden is laid out with borders on each side of a grass path. I've mixed the borders with old-fashioned roses, shrubs, and other plants in addition to the traditional herbaceous plants, such as lilies, phlox, astilbes, and lots of annuals. The Duchess terenia, or wishbone flower, coleus, rambling rose, and verbena offer color throughout the summer. The vegetable garden is inspired by the idea behind the English cottage garden, where anything goes. Flowers and herbs grow alongside the vegetables. I have sparkler cleome, lots of different kinds of salvias, and of course sunflowers and cosmos. I've used pleach hornbeams to form a formal entry into the most informal area in my garden, the work area. I love mixing elements that are both formal and informal. For instance, throughout my garden, I've placed majestic urns that I can change out with seasonal plants. Certainly, the entries into my garden are not as grand as the majestic gates found on English estates, but nonetheless, they herald the promise of something special in the garden. And my fountain garden is enclosed with a hedge. While I didn't use the traditional English yew, the effect is the same using needlepoint holly. To me, there's nothing better than a dark evergreen hedge to plant flowers against. They just show up that much better. But if you do, you want to make sure that you give yourself plenty of room between the hedge and the planting. This is for two reasons. First, is you want to make sure that you get plenty of light so that your hedge doesn't defoliate. And second, by giving yourself plenty of room, it's easier to work in the flower border and shear the hedge. This space is commonly called a catwalk. Now this design principle of abundance is certainly apparent at Arley. Those beautiful herbaceous borders are some of the oldest in Britain, so they've had plenty of time to mature. I hope that that's not discouraging to you, because even in my small garden, I started with a blank slate. Literally, I built this garden from the ground up. And early on, I relied on lots of annuals and perennials and roses to fill in as the framework of the garden matured. Over the years, as my garden has matured, I've learned lots of lessons about design. One of them is to just be generous and plant large drifts of the same color or color family, particularly when using annuals or bulbs. And that's exactly what I'm doing here as I fill these beds with tulips. In the spring, this will be a riot of bloom. I've also learned, as I mentioned before, a dark evergreen background is the perfect backdrop for flowers. 
And you never want to forget good companion plants or good bedfellows. That's why I'm planting these tulips with these wonderful little penny violas. Now as you plant your garden, just remember that from season to season and year to year, you'll be making adjustments along the way. It's just a part of the process. This idea of filling our flower beds with abundance can even be translated to balcony and patio gardens. All you need are containers. I had an opportunity to visit with Kathy Poofall, who's regarded as a container planting expert. Kathy and I put some containers together at her business, Beds and Borders, in Laurel, New York. I recently returned to check up on their progress. Kathy, since I was here just a couple of months ago, when we put these containers together, they have matured so much. They've grown beautifully, haven't they? Just look at this, that trailing rose coleus, how it works with the caliber co, it's just magnificent. Picks up the pink beautifully and right on up. It to does the right up to this tall spiky element. Absolutely, it's very yeah. dramatic, and this plant just does so well in such a variety of conditions, I love it. Well, it's such a great way to get height by taking a, a, a trellis or just some, some sticks and pulling them together and growing a vine on it. Look at this, my gosh, this formium is so bright. It's incredible, I love formium. And this is formium yellow wave, and the contrast of the yellow with the blue container, and we bring the yellow down into the Lysmachia. Oh yeah, it's just a knockout. It really is. Now, you are a real proponent of taking foliage and letting it lead the design. Absolutely, I create a foliar structure. I think that the container holds itself together much better that way, and then I actually add flowering plants to it. And if I pick a very dramatic foliar element like this formium, uh, it really lends itself to, to quite a dramatic container. And the more I contrast the foliar elements, when you have a nice big broad leaf like this next to the small, tiny leaf of the Lysmachia in this case, and you're contrasting two leaf forms, yes. the more dramatic the right. effect is. Bold texture against finer texture, and sets up more contrast, makes it more visually interesting. Absolutely, and the colors can just play with each other beautifully. Now the plant forms also play a role in creating these beautiful compositions. There's round and full and, and, and cascaders in each of these containers. And then of course those tall spiky elements lend height and elegance to a container. Absolutely, they bring your eye up and then sometimes just droop it right down. It's movement in the pot, I think that's what makes the eye linger and love the composition. And look at this one over here. It's one of my favorites. Now I've never grown this. Saccharum peel smoke, it's called. Ooh, the color is fantastic. It is a smoky color, and I think the foliar structure we were talking about earlier is well represented here with the, the tall, dramatic plant. It's and then fountain like. It is <laughs> up and down. It's very good. And this Rex begonia vine is really handsome the way it cascades down and reflects the reds or burgundies in the grass. And it has a silver tone to the leaf as well, and silver is so dominant in the middle of the pot. So you've got the purple tying in with the purple Down and the here, silver yeah. in the middle, and that foliar structure again that we discussed I think is well represented in this pot. Silvery grays, they're so good, look at them here. Talk about silver. Oh gosh, Kathy, I hadn't seen this one. This is wonderful. You've got the silver spear here. Uh-huh, Astelia. Artemisia, Poes Castle. Very, very useful in containers. I like using that a lot in containers, and I love the way you've used the wishbone flower, the Terenia, with the, the golden creeping Jenny, the Lysimachia. A little accent in there. Yeah. I think too spark. much gray is somber. Well, see this beautiful classical urn over here, and the composition follows it. It's. I love the urn shape. It sets the composition up on a pedestal and just gives Elevates it imports it. it importance and elegance. Wonderful. Gosh, and w look at this color scheme. What a contrast to what we just saw. Bright reds and burgundies. A little richer, perhaps, almost tapestry, I think, in its effect. Mm, marvelous. I love the way you've echoed the chartreuse center of that coleus with this lamium and the sedum in front. That color echo is such a useful technique in container design. It kind of unifies the design, ties it together. I really like fullness in a pot. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> there was a title Very of an, generous. <laughs> there was a title of an article once that I loved that said she just can't contain herself. <laughs> I think that kind of spelled it Pouring out. Pouring abundance into these containers. A rich variety of plants used in a container is a great way to bring the feel of a large English garden to any size home. 
Now I want to take you to one last grand English garden. And I think what really makes this garden unique is that it's completely geared toward entertaining the visitor and showing gardeners grand ideas that they can take home and try on a smaller scale. Welcome to Chatsworth, home of the 11th Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. Simon Seligman, spokesman for the estate, tells us a little about its history. Chatsworth is a lot of things to a lot of different people. I mean, primarily, it is a great building, uh, a family home. It's been the same family's home for 450 years. The house has got this landscape that has evolved around it and grown and developed and been enhanced by so many different generations of the family. And both the Duke and Duchess feel very, very strongly that if you're going to encourage people to come here, it must be sincere. In the garden, if you want to go paddling in the Cascade, you can roll up your trousers and get into the Cascade. Tell me about the Duchess's influence on this garden. The Duchess has had a huge influence. I think it's important to say that they've both had an influence, the Duke and the Duchess. They have very complementary interests out of doors. The Duke is particularly fascinated by rare plants, by the greenhouses. He's a great lover of camellias, I he understand. Is, yes, yeah. it's one of his real passions. I mean, my sense of the Duchess is that her real contribution is the grand design. Serpentine hedge, the Chiswick parterre, um, the cottage garden, the kitchen garden. They were very lucky, both of them, to inherit when they were 30. And although it was a very sad occasion because the Duke's father had died prematurely, what that's meant is that here they are 50 years on, and they've actually lived to see some of their schemes come to fruition. And things like the limes, the pleached limes on the South Lawn, for kind of 15, 20 years, apparently, they just looked ridiculous. The, the wires that they were trained along were bigger and more the plants than the plants themselves. Right. And the Duke has said um, on a number of occasions that their job is to do what they like, and it's posterity's job to judge whether it was worthy of Chatsworth. And I think that's a very good way of looking at it. <laughs> How many times have we all heard a relative or a friend just babble on about something endlessly? So much so that we think or even say, what is the point? Well, you see, gardens can do this as well. They can ramble along without any sort of focal point or directive. So what is a focal point? Well, it can be just about anything. But one of the best examples is right here at Chatsworth House in the gardens. It's called Blanche's Vase, and you can see it up there on the horizon. It directs the eye very clearly through this beautiful beach alley. See, it was commissioned by the sixth Duke of Devonshire in memory of his niece who died at age 29, way back in 1840. What's nice about this focal point is that it encourages visitors to walk the long, broad walk from the Temple of Flora at one end of the garden all the way up to the vase. Let's go up and take a little closer look. What an amazing view. Well, the walk up here is certainly worth it. Now, you see, this is an extreme example, but it's all about scale. You see, in a 100-acre garden, you need focal points this large to really work. You see, this just illustrates the importance of having that point which directs the eye. Now, in my garden, I could never host an urn this size, but there are many other things that I use to help direct the eye that are on the scale of my garden and the gardens I've designed. I know this isn't Blanche's vase, but it is a focal point, a homemade one. You see, I'm always looking for interesting, clever ideas that are inexpensive that will help me adorn my garden. This focal point takes the form of a tuteur, which is just a French word for a structure such as this. It comes from the same root as tutor, uh, meaning to train or, or help direct something, and that's exactly what this will do. I can train plants on it. It's very easy to put together. It's actually made from three V-shaped trellises. You see, I just turned the trellises upside down and brought them together and tied them with a copper wire, forming the tuteur. A wooden finial from a home improvement store brings the tuteur design together. Now, I painted mine dark green because it blends so nicely in the garden. And I planted it with vines in the spring, and here you can see it later in the summer, covered with Malabar spinach and the red flowering cypress vine. Okay, let's take a moment and explore some of the ideas that we've covered in today's show. The first was this idea of garden rooms. Taking a space and containing it, making it more manageable, is the first step in creating a beautiful garden. And when you use those 12 principles of design within that garden room, it can really bring it all together. 
Now we saw three of those principles of design in the gardens that we visited in Great Britain. The first of those was frame the view. Remember the little viewfinder I pulled out to illustrate my point? You want to identify views and then work within them. Next we saw how abundance can provide a garden with a rich tapestry. The herbaceous border at Arley is an amazing example on a grand scale, but you can also achieve this look in container plantings. We took a closer look at this idea of a focal point at Chatsworth. A focal point can be just about anything. In a large garden such as Chatsworth, the scale of Blanche's vase is perfect. In a small garden, it can be a pot of brightly colored annuals or a simple statue. I hope you'll take some of the ideas you've seen in today's show and apply them to your own garden home. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. If you're like me, you love enclosed intimate spaces. That's one of the winning characteristics that grabs our attention when we visit great gardens around the world. Join me as we explore how to create garden enclosures in our own garden homes. And we'll also see how mystery works hand in hand with enclosure. You won't want to miss it. Mm -hmm.